Hey friends, how are you? It's Mr. McKinney here with Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston. I'm excited to be here at Conley Plaza at the Harris Society for another edition of our live show we do every single Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Thank you so much for tuning in. We like to bring you a variety of, of really things about Houston history, and this time we're talking about Galveston history, of course, with Kimber Fountain. But I want to introduce you to somebody very, very special, okay? You probably know her if you know anybody in Houston's preservation community. It is Manette Basil, our board president. Here she is. Say hello, Manette. Hello. And welcome, Mr. Yes. McKinney, and to our wonderful audience. Well, it is great to have you here because guess what? She's going to give us a treat. She's going to talk about something really special here. It is Hispanic Heritage Month now until October 15th. The weather's getting nice, so we're out here in our beautiful Conley Plaza. Talk about what we're going to look at right now. Uh, we're going to talk about our uh, Mexican American history mural, which was brought and executed here at the Heritage Society two years ago during Hispanic Heritage Month. Two years ago, we, we actually debuted it. And it I really love that. Well, well, take us through real yes. quick. Yes, well, it's a beautiful tribute to many esteemed colleagues from the 20th century. So it gives us an idea of the cultural background and the history behind so many of our illustrious and distinguished citizens in the Mexican-American community. And a lot of these people, I'm sure you'll know, mm -hmm. but now you get to see them kind of, uh, you know, done up in a special way. So yes. let, let's go through it. Yes, and our, the artist for this was uh, Jesse Cifuentes, along with uh, his, his partner, yeah, Laura, uh, Laura Lopez Cano. Lopez Cano. She's great. And they designed this and did an amazing job. It took them months and months to execute this. But some of the luminaries are, of course, Nympha Lorenzo, the famous uh, Mama Nympha and her restaurant. Everybody knows Mama Nympha. So along with folks like Lydia Mendoza, who is a famous Tejano singer, she performed at the Pan American Nightclub and on a number of radio stations throughout the region. We moved down a ways, we see uh, Guadalupe Church, which was one of the first Mexican-American churches, very historic building uh, here in, in Houston. And then more luminaries, some of our elected officials, for example, uh, Felix Braga, who is a city council member, and his family founded Tejas Office Supplies, one of the biggest in the, in the region. We had two wonderful co-chairs for this whole thing that helped to raise the funds and pick the artists, and that was Orlando Sanchez, former uh, county treasurer. Treasurer, yeah. And also uh, Christina Morales with Morales Funeral Home on the east side, and you see her there depicted in the middle in the second And now she's a state row. rep for the area she, she grew is. up in. She's so a how, state representative. How so exciting is that? People and, keep going, and over here to the far right, uh, we have Gracie Science with her hand raised. She was the first Latina to be elected to city council in Houston and a wonderful supporter of the Heritage Society. We also, and this is kind of my favorite, is President John F. Kennedy, who gave a speech to LULAC, League of Urban Latin American Citizens, in 1963, the night before he was assassinated. This was really an incredible moment for the Hispanic uh, Mexican-American community in Houston. He was accompanied by his wife, Jackie, who gave a tribute to the audience totally in Spanish. And of course, behind them, uh, former President Lyndon Johnson and Lady Bird Johnson. And to the far, far right is Judge Hernandez. Judge Hernandez was a huge fixture for LULAC and was able to invite and get the president uh, here to speak. And then unfortunately, the next day, he was assassinated. This took place at the Rice Hotel, which we all know has been renovated and is now a fabulous uh, place for loft apartments. That has been great. So guess what? There's so much more in that mural that you need to come here and check it out for yourself, okay? So this is Conley Plaza. It's one of the rental spaces we have here at the Heritage Society. And we just wanted to introduce you to our awesome mural so you can learn more about Houston's history, Houston's Mexican-American contributions. Thank you so much, Manette Basil, for Thank showing us. Thank you for, for featuring this on the show this month. Very important. Yes, very important. Thank you again. We'll see you at the next show. Take care, guys. Let's bring you through and show you. Uh, actually, we're going to meet with Allison Bell, our executive director. So we're about to take you inside. Uh, we're going to go a very special way. We're going to go through our uh, kitchen space. Um, it's the easiest way to get back to the actual studio. And if you haven't had a chance to learn about what we have inside the studio, if you missed the last couple of shows, we're really blessed because one of our board members, Kirk C. Gregg, Kirksey Greg Productions LLC has been so kind to be able to transform 
our, our tea room, our historical tea room, and turn it into what you're going to see very shortly, okay? So we're taking you through the back way. Here we go. The VIP back entrance back way. Uh, mind your step over there as we come in through this space. Now, it's a full commercial kitchen, which we also allow people to rent out this space as well. This happens all the time here at the Heritage Society, uh, and we use it for private events and things like that. So we're lucky to be able to have all this spaces here. Conley Plaza, the St. John's Place. And actually, Allison Bells will talk a lot about that shortly. So... Okay, well, here we are. Here we are in the awesome studio that we have at the Heritage Society at St. Houston Park. Again, this is the old historical tea room that we've transformed into this particular space, okay? All right, and we have with us Allison Bell. How are you, Allison Bell? Hello, welcome back. Thank you for being here again. No, you know, it's our pleasure to be here. And what we're doing today is we're going to talk about uh, Galveston history. Before we do, we're actually going to introduce you to Kimber Fountain a second. Before we do, we're going to once again thank Manette Basil for joining us earlier and, uh, and being able to show you Conley Plaza. And also what we mentioned earlier was the big mural that we have here. It's been about two years now, and it's exciting. So thank you again to Manette Basil, who is our board president for the Heritage Society and really an active member in Houston's historical community. Uh, I always say she needs her iconic beret, right? <laughs> it's yeah. okay. We'll, we'll get that to her. Actually, the weather's getting beret weather, right? Yes, and yes. now it's time for Allison Bell. So here she is, once again, our executive director for the Heritage Society. Always a pleasure to have oh her God. here. <laughs> Who the heck did you find that one? Well, uh, explain I this photo. That, one. that was on Halloween night during um, one of uh, a, can a campaign, and we were in the Montrose area celebrating Halloween. See, I have a little witch's hat on my head and a little pumpkin and that's my husband, and he was campaigning for something. Who knows Look what? Look at that. Isn't that hilarious? She was a performer in one of the nightclubs. <laughs> oh, that's fun. So there we go. That's great um, that you found well, that. Talk about what's happening. We just we just introduced people to Conley Plaza, but you had something really funny here happen over the weekend, right? Oh, I had a couple of events. Um, Saturday, there was a march of some women who were trying to get the vote out to people, and they started at Sabine, and they made their way over to Connolly Plaza, where you all just were. And they gathered in the plaza, and they um, specifically came to see the women's exhibit because they're trying to remind women of the importance of the right to vote that they've only had for 100 years. Mm -hmm. So they toured the plaza, and then they went into the women's exhibit and walked around there so that we were very excited to have them. Wow. And, then, of course, St. John's Oh, and Church. then weddings. Uh, those are my favorite events. We, I had a wedding weekend before last, and these are the little bridesmaids. I mean, uh, flower girls you see right there. So beautiful bride and her dad. Those are the always happy occasions. And again, it's nice to once again showcase Conley Plaza because the weather's getting nice right now. And if you need some place to be able to rent out for an event, it's always available. Just give Allison Bell a call. Yes. She handles all the rentals. And it really is a lot of space out there to be beautiful. able to. It is beautiful, especially this time of year. Um, so we're looking forward to letting people know more about what we have here at the Heritage Society and then ways that you can support the programs that are here by simply uh, learning about the spaces that you can uh, have an event at. A small gathering, gathering, COVID-friendly gathering, outdoors. Now the weather's yeah, finally right nice. in front of our Long Row building. And then we talked last week about this beautiful garden behind the Stati House with the armillary. Um, and this, this is a beautiful place to have an event as well. And there are just restrooms right around the corner. So um, well, as soon as our park opens up, you know, our park is still closed. Um, we'll have some activity in the park. But right now I can um, definitely rent places because you have the whole park to yourself at this moment. Of course, we still have our women's exhibit going on, the 100 years of celebrating the women's right to vote and you may recall that this is about local women in Houston, the women that affected the movement and not only in Houston and in Texas. So it's not just the national movement, it's the local movement. It's very just and a pretty exciting. And then I wanted to tell you today, we actually had a Girl Scout troop come in and um, they there is a badge, I didn't know this until today, a suffrage badge that they can get. So today was our first group of Girl Scouts. We had about 12 young ladies and I'm hoping that we can spread the word to the other Girl Scout troops um, that, and if you're out there watching and you know some Girl Scouts or some mothers who are Scout moms, tell them, spread the word, they can come have a private tour. We offer a 25% discount because they're a nonprofit and they can see the women's exhibit. And uh, Anne Sloan was actually the tour 
uh, guide today. And it's time for Your prizes. favorite it's part. Favorite it's time part. for prizes. Here we go. Okay, yes. so if you tuned in last week, which we hope you did, and we hope you always tune in. For those who watched, Christopher Varela uh, talked about early Radio Houston history. There he is, centered around our awesome mural that Manette Basil, our board chair, just showed you outside earlier mm -hmm. in front of the Pan American Ballroom, the Pan American Nightclub. There it is. A KLVL stands for La Voz Latina. It wasn't a test question about that. So if you stayed till the end, till the end of the program, <laughs> and you listen to Chris Varela, you're going to get these answers right. So here we go. All right. That's Louis Piney. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Okay, so. so. What does KTRH stand for? And the answer, I know the answer to this. Because my husband worked for them. Yeah, he sure <laughs> did. And the answer, do you recognize that iconic building? Come to the Rice Hotel. So they were out of the Rice Hotel in the very beginning. Yeah, he talked about that. Just uh -huh. C.H. Jones. Our winner, Catherine Fitzgerald Schrommick. That's right. I know she's tuning in because she tuned in at the very beginning of this. So thank you so much, oh, Catherine. I kind of didn't know if she won. Yeah. Well, you won, by the way. Here we way go. Way to go, Catherine. Way to go, Catherine. Let's see who else won. So our next question oh, and is. Remember, we need to. Y'all need to reach out to us because we have a hard time finding you. On, so if you won, reach yes. out to us. Send us a message. Us. Yeah, There's numerous us. ways to do that. Please let us know. Uh, you know, and we're going to try to get a hold of you as well. But we've got a. a box full of prizes, right? An office full I know, of prizes. No, because to... I can't find people. I try to reach out on Messenger. So if y'all could just send me Check an email, your abel at heritagesociety.org or call us. I can give you the There you email. go. Look up Heritage Society. Give Allison Bell a call, yeah, the executive yeah. director, and she'll connect you with your prize that you won, Catherine, and other people today. So next question. Which military installment in World War I specifically did Alfred Patrick Daniel serve in the Army? Which military? And the answer? There's a clue. Oh, there's a clue. It's up in the air. Ellington Field. And the winner? Sandra Lord. Hey. Our buddy Sandra Lord. Sandra Lord, oh, by the way, her. the author of Ghosts of Houston's Market Square Park. She's going to be our guest on the show October 14th. So do not miss out October 14th. Does Sandra she know Lord. She won? Does you know, she well, she does now because she's tuning oh, she's in. Watching. That's, That's right. right. Make sure that you do watch. Okay, our third question. Here we go. What were the highly flammable devices that were required to run the radio station? Here's a clue. <laughs> the Energizer. Oh. Keeps going and going. Here's a clue. And the answer? More clues. Oh, look. Oh, is that like a close-up of what it that is? That is a close-up of what it uh -huh. is. So who knows the answer? Here we go. B plus batteries. Yes, it's very technical, very specific. And the winner is? Bill Brimmer. There He's won go. something before, too. He has so won multiple times. I He's kind of a KPRC a, uh, radio uh, and channel oh. 2 histor uh, historian. He's a good guy. So there he is. Bill, you won. So uh, we're going to give you a call. I'm going to call you. Allison's going to call you. Make sure you get your prize. Reach out uh, but to he us. answered it correctly. The large uh, you know, uh, B batteries that are there, B plus batteries. So there you go. Good job, Bill Brimmer. Okay. What was the first broadcasting station in Houston? And a hint is it starts with a W. Not what you're thinking, right? We're always thinking that everything west of Mississippi starts with a K. Okay. Nope, that's mm -hmm. not true. That rumor was debunked by our awesome guest speaker, Christopher Varela. Mm -hmm. He talked about it and told us the reason why. And let's get the answer is... W-E-V. W-E-V, station W-E-V, first one to go on the air here in Houston. Still and of course, Bill Stewart. Well, yeah. and that's Bill Stewart background. got it correctly. So there you go. <laughs> Somebody who's been on radio for numerous years, uh, Bill Stewart, good job, got it right. Okay, here we go. Last question. What was the year that the very first commercial radio station went on the air in Houston? Okay, who knows the answer? Let's see. Answer is? 1925. So you got 1925. There you go. You got it right. And the station is? KPRC. KPRC. There you go. And the winner is? Phil. Hey. Phil, you're breaking it in. He got it right. You got two, <laughs> Phil. Good job. Okay, so there you go. So that's the five questions we asked last time. You're going to get five more new questions yep. this time by Kimber Fountain, our awesome author of the Galveston Seawall Chronicles, coming up very shortly. Yes. Um, and for those not familiar with Phil Stewart, this is Phil Stewart. <laughs> There he is. He's a tour guide He now is too. a tour guide, actually. He bought Sandra Lord's company, Discover Houston Tours, and you can check out Phil at discoverhoustontours.com. I'm sure he's tuning in, but there you go, Phil Stewart. Congratulations, Phil. Two answers right. You probably got more answers than that, but guess what? Other people chimed in first, but you did a great job. Thanks for participating, and thanks for chiming in. So there we go. Okay, let's see what else we have. Well, thank you so much, thank Allison you. Bell. We do appreciate your time, and thank we'll see you, you. next week okay. on the live show. Bye-bye.
Okay. Well, we want to once again thank Kirksey Gregg for uh, doing what he did with this amazing space over here. We really are very blessed to have him on our board. And, uh, and like I said, he's transformed our beautiful historical tea room into this space that we call our new studio for our live show and the radio show that we do here. So there you go. Thanks again. We appreciate our new studio. Kirksey Gregg Productions, LLC, a board member here, active and the owner of the Ballroom at the Bayou Place right there at the beautiful 1967 historic Albert Thomas Convention Center. Stay tuned to the Hair Society because we'll be doing some events eventually over in that space. And there's some really cool hidden features that Laura Woods is actually working on as our development director. So lots of fun things that are happening. Once again, the Ballroom at Bayou Place, there it is right there in downtown Houston. Okay, uh, a couple of announcements. First and foremost, want to say happy birthday to the historic 1940 Air Terminal Museum. Uh, I want you to learn about this space because uh, this is a really great gem here in Houston, an example of preservation done correctly. So they turned 80 years old over the weekend on September 26th, and you can go to 1940airterminal.org. You probably remember our guest that we had on. His name was Michael Bloodworth, and he talked about the history of Houston aviation history. So there you go. Uh, and they also have a space that you can rent out as well. It's a really, really attractive space. And just uh, like I said, us sharing information about our partners in this historical community, want to be good partners, and want to make sure all of y'all are informed about everything that's happening in the historical community. Uh, so we like the fact that this is your go-to place at the Heritage Society. Thank you again, by the way, to Christopher Varela for being our speaker last week and really taking us on a journey through Houston's radio history. Did a great job. You can uh, see this on YouTube, by the way. We're going to let you know where the link is. Next Wednesday, October 7th, is a really, really big day for us here at the Heritage Society because we have with us the one and only Barry Scardino Bradley is joining us, architectural historian extraordinaire, seven plus books on Houston history topics alone. We're going to go through her books and her legacy over the course of 40 years preserving and promoting Houston's history, specifically with architecture. So we are blessed to have her on the show. Do not miss out Wednesday, October 7th. She's also, by the way, doing an encore or actually doing a rather a different kind of lecture about her specific book. The Improbable Metropolis, and that book is going to talk about the history of Houston in detail, and she's doing a program in partnership with the Heritage Society in AIA Houston on October 22nd at 6 p.m. Okay, so she'll be live on the radio show that we have at 3 o'clock, and then she's going to jet over and do the, uh, the lecture that she has, too. Uh, so we're blessed, and that actually counts for credit, I believe, for the architects out there listening. Go out there and get your CE credits. You know you need them, so listen to the show, because that's happening once again October 22nd, Thursday, October 22nd at 6 o'clock. Barry Scardino Bradley. And again, she's going to be on our live show on the 7th of October, which is next week. Okay? All right. A brand new book is out. I showed you earlier. It's called The Ghost of Houston's Market Square Park. It's by Sandra Lord. If you've been in Houston for 40 years, then you know about her walking tours that she gives. She really is somebody who's dedicated to Houston history and dedicated to promoting our city. And she's going to be in our show October 14th. Okay, so these are two important dates to keep on your calendar, October 14th and October 7th. So stay tuned for Sandra Lord and learn about the ghosts of Houston's Market Square Park. All right. By the way, Daniel E. Monsanto, who you, who you heard from um, two weeks ago on September 2nd, actually three weeks ago at the start of the month, actually, wow. He's going to be on my live radio show tomorrow, Thursday at 3 o'clock on 90.1 KPFT. So if you missed the show, you're going to hear all about Houston history through postcards happening once again on Thursday, this Thursday, tomorrow at 3 o'clock on 90.1 KPFT. It's called The Houston Hour with Mr. McKinney and Paige Myrick. And also, he's going to talk about, which I want to make sure everybody knows, there is a big postcard show happening this Saturday and this Friday, this Friday and Saturday, happening over at, uh, and actually, you know what? You've got to watch the radio show because he's going to give you all the details because we're getting close out of time. But I want to let you know, watch the, listen to the show tomorrow, and then if you actually watch the, um, the show that we did on YouTube, you'll be able to see it as well. But it's happening this weekend. So if you like postcards, historic postcards, come join me. Come join Daniel E. Monsanto at the postcard show. So just fun things that are happening around here in Houston. As as we mentioned earlier, on YouTube, Heritage Society's page on YouTube, we want you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It costs you nothing to subscribe, and if you have a Google account, a Gmail account, you automatically have a YouTube account. You just don't know it, but you do, and we'd love for you to come follow us on YouTube for the Heritage Society as a subscriber, because you'll hear about and see the videos that we're doing, including videos about the houses that we have in detail. Michael Dalio's done a lot of great house of videos as far as well. Architecture of Houston, Houston History Tours, and African American History Plus all this is available at the Heritage Society's YouTube channel.
Okay, so please make sure you do that too. Um, lastly, uh, go ahead and like Mr. McKinney's Historic Houston and the Houston History Bus because we do a variety of free tours throughout the year. The weather is finally getting nice. Uh, we do 50% capacity on board the Houston History Bus, and we'd love to invite you to come join us for a free tour. It's a great public service, and you get to learn about Houston history in a very unique way on board Houston's only open-air school bus, mobile classroom. But you've got to like and follow these pages over here. It takes you a couple seconds and costs you nothing, so please come join us. We'd love to have you. All right, the moment you've all been waiting for, please welcome the one and only Kimber Fountain, Galveston author and historian. Come on down, Kimber Fountain. There she is. How are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you? I'm Let's doing fine. We'll have a seat. Let's get started because this has been an anticipated event. I cannot tell you how many folks loved your talk that you gave last time. It was like, when is she coming back? And I said, well, we're going to get her back. Let's get her back next week, next month. So here we go. This here is I am. exciting. You are here on the live show, and we're going to talk about a couple things today, but really, because, you know, it is the 120th anniversary of the Great Storm of 1900. That happened earlier on the 8th and 9th, of course, uh, but that was a catalyst for something really and special that you talk about in detail. Yes, I do. Well, first off, there's a huge misunderstanding surrounding the Great Storm of 1900, and that's that when the storm came that it completely annihilated Galveston's status as an international port of commerce. And uh, actually what did that was uh, Houston in 1914 when the Houston Ship Channel opened. And so a lot of historians and, and uh, mainstream history has forgotten that chunk of time between 1900 and 1914 mm -hmm. uh, when Galveston continued to thrive and we actually rebounded from the great storm of 1900 to an, with an unprecedented amount of uh, tenacity. And that <coughs> resulted in one of the most, still what's considered one of the most um, advanced and monumental feats of civil engineering that's ever been accomplished in the history of the United States. And that, of course, is the construction of the seawall, Galveston Seawall, and the subsequent grade raising that happened after that. And so, so that's the basic premise of my book. That's one of the main themes of my first book. Show your book. Uh, the Galveston Seawall Chronicles. This came out in, in uh, 2017. It started out as a series for my magazine, the Galveston Monthly, and then uh, was uh, translated into the book, transformed into the book. I actually expanded the book quite a bit from the series. And so we start in the book, of course, briefly talking about the Great Storm, because that's what people, most people know about that, but you can't tell the story of the seawall without telling the story of the storm. So we start there. And what's important to understand about Galveston. So this is the eastern end of the island right here. This is the bay side. This is right the bay here. side. Yeah. This is the harbor, actually. Yeah, so if you're familiar harbor. with Galveston and you know you go mm -hmm. out to the seawall, you're actually. Seawall yeah. is, is now over here. This is a really old 19th century uh, rendering of the island. So this is the Gulf of Mexico out here. So what happened during the Great Storm of 1900 is that the Gulf waters, at the behest of 140 mile an hour winds, uh, came onto the island and basically scraped two thirds of the island clean, and they pushed the sub. They pushed everything that had been built on the southern edge of the island into this massive. All of our beautiful buildings downtown on the Strand that still stand today, but it meant disaster and destruction, of course, for um, for the next. Or you got it? You want me to do it? <laughs> uh, for oops, wrong way. Uh, so this is an example of that debris that piled up. Um, this is a, a photograph, obviously, from right after the 1900 storm. And uh, so you can tell that, uh, that, I mean, you can't even imagine what was in there, you know, and not aside from the bodies as well as, you know, pieces of homes and furniture and, you know, all of people's lives uh, in that debris wall. And so um, a huge effort was launched in order to save Galveston from this ever happening again. And it was a monumental effort spearheaded by uh, um, several elite businessmen at the time, but most prominently um, Ike Kempner, um, Isaac H. Kempner, who we call Ike. Yeah, the mayor and, of Galveston, right? Um, he was mayor at one point, well, later, later, yeah, like later. Yeah. but he was instrumental in uh, um, changing, not only changing the city charter uh, to better uh, our city government structure, but also he 
launched this campaign that was called the Spirit of Galveston or the Spirit of the Islands, and he rallied the entire town uh, behind you know its leaders in order again to make sure that this never happened again. And so, together with uh, the rest of the city officials, they assembled a board of engineers. And this board of engineers was comprised of Henry, uh, General Henry Roberts, Alfred Noble, who was um, a, a civil engineer. He actually designed the breakwater in Chicago, if you're familiar with that, um, as well as a man named Edmund, Edward, Med, Edmund Cheesebro, who is one of my favorite historical uh, figures as well. And so the, basically the Board of Engineers got together and they designed this two-step plan. Uh, and the first step was, of course, to build a seawall. And uh, this is kind of a rendering, an early rendering, of what, uh, this, how the seawall construction would kind of take place. So here you see they built these frames here out of wood um, after putting pylons into the ground. And then they actually built a rail car, a rail line, uh, parallel to the line of the seawall so that they could truck in the materials on rail cars. And then you know, it was a much more efficient way uh, to build the seawall there as well. So the first step was uh, putting these pil pilings um, into the ground. And so they did a combination of flat um, rectangular pilings and then round pilings and they staggered them and they drilled, uh, drilled them eight feet um, into the ground. And here you see a pile driver, an old fashioned pile driver right there taking care of that. And uh, here's another picture of that from the other side of that. And you can see the gulf in the background right here. So these are, this is the very first step. And uh, here's a better uh, further out view. So what they did um, is see how these are segmented here as well on the seawall. What they did was they built every other section at a time. They wanted to build sections so that it would have room to sway and to give because after all, it was going to be filled with concrete, which is a pretty static uh, material. And so they wanted it to have a room uh, to kind of grow and swell if it needed to. And so they built each subsequent uh, section and then went back and filled them in. But uh, so the front of the seawall was concave. And the purpose of that was to send the waves back onto themselves. Um, so when the waves come up, and you've probably seen, there were even some, I think when Laura was getting close to us, of uh, those huge, yeah. the waves just popping up on top of the, um, uh, yeah. you know, the seawall, and that's why, because the seawall is specifically designed to send those waves back on top of themselves there. Also, what you see here is this is called riprap. It's a uh, granite, and uh, so they trucked in this granite from a quarry in central Texas and uh, use these huge cranes, of course, to lay it. And some of that riprap you can still see today. A lot of it has been covered with sand and, and the accretion of the dunes and such, but some of it is still, still quite visible today. So here's an, another closer photograph of those frames for the seawall and uh, how they were constructed. And then we get to the fun part, which was filling everything in with concrete. So they utilized the same rail system and they had huge concrete mixers set on top of these rail um, cars that, you know, that straddled across the, the line. And then they would just um, turn over and dump the concrete um, into uh, the seawall, into the molds over here. So here, this is a better photo of them taking uh, materials off of the rail cars. I mean, you can, they would, this thing would swing 180 degrees and swing everything over to the side that it needed to be on. And uh, here's another photo of that. And then we have a photo of them laying that granite rip rock I told you about. And this is one of my favorite photos. These guys are inside one of those seawall frames. And uh, these are the workers. And of course, they're probably leveling out things in there and making sure it's uh, stable. And you can see the rebar right there as well that they use to reinforce the concrete inside the seawall also. Um, all right, so um, what a lot of people don't understand as well about the early days of the seawall is that it wasn't originally one big straight long line like it is now. Uh, today, of course, it reaches from the very east end of the island all the way down to, you know, past 91st Street over there. But originally, the seawall was an L shape. So this is a map from 1914. Interestingly, they added uh, the logistics of the seawall down here, I guess, just so people were in, would be interested. But you see this line right here. This was the original seawall. So it actually started at the harbor and it came down southward and then hit the Gulf Coast and then it took a, right, a left-hand turn and then uh, traveled the length 
uh, the length of the goal side. And of course, it was extended several times. So later on, you'll hear me talk about the extensions of the seawall. And so what they did, they actually, from this point here, they extended it eastward. This is the east end of the island over here. And originally, this was all marsh and, and swamp, and it was actually a landfill at one point, too. Um, and so they eventually filled all that in as well. And so this original arm of 6th Street right here, um, where the wall went down 6th Street, is actually entombed underneath UTMB. Uh, right now and so um, one time they were doing some construction and kind of pulled some stuff away and you could see old pieces of that seawall underneath uh, but it's an interesting thing to learn about because a lot of people again uh, don't realize that the seawall was built in sections you know it wasn't really just all done um, to what you see today at the end so uh, the next step after the seawall was built uh, the board of engineers uh, were concerns, of course, when they were designing their plan. If anyone remembers what happened to New Orleans uh, during Katrina when the levees broke, right? That area, that Ninth Ward just filled up like a, a soup bowl. And so the engineers knew that if they were just to build the seawall, that that would inevitably, inevitably put Galveston in that same uh, predicament to where if it, it, if waters were to come in it would basically that seawall would actually trap water in and it wouldn't do anything to release it and so subsequently the Board of Engineers said that we needed to elevate the grade of the island behind the seawall and so for over here is where it started so this whole east end of the island and then all of this area uh, behind here south of Broadway um, it was all elevated at an average of 13 feet and they started um, by elevating the area directly behind the seawall. And we'll get to that in just a second. So how the, gra the grade raising, absolutely phenomenal. This was the very first story of Galveston that I love, ever learned about, and I just love it. So they would build these levees. These are grade raising, they were called levee districts. And in these grade raising districts, they would build these levees. And then you see this pipe that's coming in. This pipe would actually pump the fill into these grade raising districts. Well, the fill was actually 90% water and only 10% silt. Uh, but they had to do that so that they could make that fill travel long distances through these pipes. And so they would rush this silt and water mixture in and then wait for the water to, uh, to recede. And then you'd be left with a fine layer of silt. And then they would do it again and again and again and again. In order to accomplish that, of course, homes had to be elevated, right? Um, so you see the pilings, the brick pilings. Now if you drive around Galveston, you'll see maybe a foot or two of those brick pilings that are still exposed. Um, and you might not even realize that there's another anywhere from eight to 10 feet of those pilings below what you're seeing if you're in a certain place of the island. Now, the tricky part was that each homeowner had to pay to raise their own house. And they also had to suffer through the grade raising that lasted eight years. Um, so they would build boardwalks in between houses to get over the watery fill. And just the sacrifice that these people made to ensure the longevity and the posterity of Galveston is really something, and one of the reasons I think history is important, because sometimes it's hard, uh, you know, we, we, we lose sight that change takes generations, you know, or that sometimes the things that we're doing now, we really won't see the effect of that until many, many years later, perhaps outside of our lifetime. And that was certainly true of the Galveston grade raising. And that's one reason why I was so attracted and drawn to this story in, its early, in, in my early years of studying Galveston history, because I was just amazed uh, that a community could rally um, like that and do that. So in order to facilitate those big pipes, they actually had to build a canal um, across the island because they were, uh, they were pulling the fill from the harbor side, all right? So let's go back to the map really quickly. So what they did was they cut this canal right parallel with this arm of the seawall. So these, what they were called self-loading hopper dredges, so they would suck up the fill um, over in the harbor and then they would careen down this canal, down and to wherever these docking stations were. You see back here the docking station, and they would attach the hopper dredge to that docking station, and that is where when the fill would be released and then sent into the certain grade raising district. Now, interestingly enough, what where this canal is, all of that land that used to be there is actually what is now Seawall Boulevard, because that is how 
they created the seawall uh, sea boulevard. They cut the canal 200 feet behind the seawall and then they used that land that they had excavated from the canal to fill in behind the seawall and that created a 17 foot elevated, um, elevated seawall boulevard as we know it today. Now that 17 feet at the height of the seawall wasn't random. It just so happened that the highest point of the storm surge from the great storm of 1900 was 15.7 feet. So they said, well, let's just err on the side of caution, right? And we'll just add another foot to that. And uh, so that's where they got 17 feet for the height of the seawall. So this was absolutely amazing. The topper dredges were owned by a company called Goddard and Bates. By the end of the grade raising, Goddard and Bates were bankrupt. They lost everything and they didn't actually didn't even have the funds to finish the job, um, but they did it anyway. And their legacy lives on now 120 years later. So this is a better shot of those docking stations where the uh, where the, uh, the, the chopper dredge would hook up with the pipe and then you see this massive amount of fill um, just being released into that grade raising district right there. Um, just ruminate on that photo for a minute and just and think about this. This is 1904 guys. This is 1904 to 1911 when technology by our standards today would be considered primitive and yet um, they were able to design uh, you know, one of the most efficient ways uh, to, uh, you know, to accomplish this civil engineering feat that they did. Um, here's another shot of the pipe. Some of them have bust apparently at this point. And uh, there's uh, the Kubel people watching by right there from his raised house. But look how massive these pipes were too. I mean, they were anywhere from 12 to 18 feet. Um, 12, sorry, tw yeah, no, not 12 to 18 feet. I'm sorry, 18 inches, a foot and a half up to 10 feet wide. And uh, this is a, just a really cool kind of human shot. Uh, so here they are walking on one of those boardwalks I told you about that were erected in each grade raising district in order to allow people uh, to traverse um, throughout the town without having to get their feet wet and muddy. And sometimes those walkways would actually go through the parlors of houses. And uh, so somebody's parlor would just become part of the sidewalk during the grade raising. Um, this is uh, the uh, Letitia Rosenberg women's home. Um, the last I checked, this home is actually on the market now. It's on 25th Street, but you can see it did not matter what size the building was. Um, they were going to elevate it if they had to. And so uh, they would have uh, these uh, wrenches, you know, these guys with these big jacks as set up at each station around the house. And there would be a guy off to the side banging a drum. And so the, the uh, men would operate the jacks to the beat of those drums so that they could all stay in sync. Pretty cool. So this is an e the eastern portion of the seawall right where it about starts to curve around that original curve down 6th Street. So you can see now originally on the east end of the seawall, it was actually a residential area. Uh, today, of course, right along the boulevard, uh, that's all commercial and, uh, and retail spaces, but it wasn't originally like that. It originally had some really gorgeous homes right along uh, seawall. And in uh, celebration of the completion of the uh, grade raising, several of uh, Galveston's elite, uh, including Ike Kempner, got together and decided that they needed to build a monument uh, to Galveston's future in celebration. And that monument was the Hotel Galvez, uh, built in 1911. Uh, for over a million dollars, which of course is um, 10 times that, uh, you know, today. And uh, so this is a very early shot of the Hotel Galvez, perfectly uh, framed by the seawall here at the bottom. So the best part about the seawall overall is that aside from it simply being um, a, a monumental feat of civil engineering and, you know, a testament to community, it was also it became over the course of this of the 20th century this intriguing snapshot not just of Galveston history but of American history because unlike the Strand where our historic buildings have remained stoic for over 120 to 130 years the sea
seawall was constantly evolving and changing in order to adapt to the uh, different entertainment uh, venues and, and trends that were happening throughout the different decades. And so that is where the book comes in. After I tell you all that fascinating stuff and go into detail about the seawall and about uh, the grade raising, then I take you through that journey of the 20th century and talk to you about that evolution of the seawall. And so in the end, again, it becomes more about American history than just Galveston history. It's basically American history just through a Galveston lens on the seawall. So one of the first things that was uh, completed after the Hotel Galvez was Electric Park in 1914. And this is a view of that. Now Electric Park um, was at a, kind of had an ulterior motive. And there was a theory that if, uh, if the city could get people to stay overnight, uh, or if they could get them to stay later into the day, that they could then get them to stay overnight. Um, so originally when the seawall was built, it wasn't like hotels just started springing up and everything. Uh, Galveston was still pretty much a daytime destination as far as um, tourists and visitors to the island went. And so we utilized that superior technology at the time called electricity. And we built Electric Park um, on the seawall. You can see the gulf out in the background. Uh, so there were over a thousand tungsten lights strung throughout Seawall Park. This was the aerial swing. And you notice that each light was lit and studded with different light bulbs. And so when that thing would lift up and get going, it would just look like this big stroboscopic, you know, sphere in the night sky. It was really a sight to behold. And here's another a view of Seawall Park from the gulf or from the beach side, looking out over the seawall. Now you can also see here that this strip of seawall boulevard now uh, was not originally as large as it is now, or at least as wide as it is today. So originally the Board of Engineers had recommended uh, that the boulevard be 200 feet wide. Again, they built that canal, you know, 200 feet off of the seawall, but city didn't want to waste prime real estate, right? And so they decided, huh, we'll just make the boulevard 100 feet wide. And so that's why it looks much um, smaller uh, than it is today. Uh, now, eventually, of course, after the first hurricane, after the seawall was built, hit the islands, they realized that maybe they needed to back things up a bit. So that is when, unfortunately, all of this was demolished. And then they expanded and widened the boulevard to 200 feet. Here's another view on the side of that. So much different than it is today. Um, in the background right here, these two little monuments you can see those still on the on the seawall today. That is the grade raising monument that was actually uh, put into place before the grade raising was even completed. Uh, we like to uh, celebrate our accomplishments before they were even done. And in the background um, is Murdoch's, uh, the, one of the original Murdoch's back there. But uh, this is at the foot of 23rd Street, by the way. So I didn't mention that earlier. Electric Park spans the blocks in between 23rd and 24th Street on the seawall. And yet another view of that, Murdoch's over here. You can see the riprap and then all the people and Electric Park as well. Uh, another thing they built, started to build uh, along the seawall were bathhouses. I already mentioned Murdoch's, but this is back when a time, you know, when today pretty much everyone has a swimsuit, you know, even if you don't live on the Gulf Coast, there's a swimming pool somewhere, you've taken a trip and you have to have a swimsuit. But that was not a part of a person's wardrobe, you know, back at this time in the early 20th century. And so bathhouses would rent swimsuits to people and they would also give them a place to change. Um, and those swimsuits were made of wool as well. So just imagine swimming in the Gulf in 100 degree heat in a wool swimsuit. <laughs> no thanks, right? But what was really special about Crystal Palace's bathhouse uh, was it had all sorts of amenities. It had shooting galleries, it had restaurants and coffee shops, it was a terrace on the roof uh, where you could uh, see views of the Gulf, but most strikingly was this overpass that went over the boulevard and actually so people could go straight from the changing rooms of the Crystal Palace, cross over that, and then uh, take the stairs down to the beach. And in today's time, it's been mentioned several times that perhaps we should build some of those, uh, you know, today uh, to uh, allow better, easier ingress and egress over to the beach side. Talk about a crowd, right? Can you imagine? I mean, we think that the seawall gets crowded today. I can't even imagine being down there with those people and everybody's in suits and full length dresses and hats and uh, the heat factor there. But this is um, the original Murdoch's bathhouse right there as well, constructed in 1911. And you can also see another name you might recognize right here, Guido's. Uh, the original Guido's was actually inside Murdoch's bathhouse. 
at 23rd Street. And then, of course, it's been around for both of these for 109 years now, more than that for Murdoch's. But, all right. So then the 1920s come in, and one of the biggest things that was established on the seawall in the 1920s was the Galveston Beach Association. And that uh, spearheaded an effort to infuse the seawall with class and couture. And so an idea was launched to, uh, to um, establish a beauty pageant, although at first it was more of a costume pageant, because again, it was about couture and style and bringing kind of a bit of the, you know, kind of uh, East Coast zhuzh over to the seawall. And so you can see all of our lovely bedazzled ladies here. This is from 1922 in one of the first uh, Galveston Island Bathing Girl Reviews, as it was called. Now, later on, the Bathing Girl Review would uh, become the international pageant of pulchritude, and one of uh, Galveston's biggest claims to fame is that that pageant would then later on be uh, translated into what is now the Miss Universe pageant. But pe uh, women came from all over the world uh, to compete. Here's another photo of ladies in their costumes. Now, interestingly, the Beach Review was the brainchild of a man named William Rowe. William Rowe was hired by Sam Maceo. Uh, now, Sam Maceo, of course, and his brother, Rosario, uh, kind of defined the seawall in the 1920s through the 1950s throughout their, with their various efforts. Now, of course, their most... Uh, most known for their um, illegal gambling and illegal liquor during Prohibition enterprises. But uh, Sam and Rose Maceo were a lot more than that. Uh, within one year of entering into bootlegging and rum running, they opened up their very first restaurant on the seawall. And then they established the Galveston Beach Association, hired William Rowe, because they knew that Galveston's illegitimate economy, if you will, their gambling clubs and everything, were really at the mercy of Galveston's legitimate reputation. But it wasn't just that. The Maceos really cared about Galveston. There's something about living there. It just gets into your soul, right? And people love Galveston, and Sam and, Macy, Sam and Rose uh, loved Galveston as well, and they really wanted uh, Galveston to become an international, world-class entertainment destination, not just for the benefit of their clubs, but of their benefit for the island and for Texas as well. And a quick plug for this book, because sure. you actually cover them in detail. This is the I awesome do. wise biography, by the way. It is called The Maceos and the Free State of Galveston by Kimber Fout. It's her newest book that she has out. It's almost twice the size of these books. Mm -hmm. It's really thick. A lot of great history, and I, we're going to have you come back eventually and talk about yeah. this legacy in detail. Maybe even have you come back in February for Valentine's Day and talk about the red light district. But even for today, though, I am, uh, oh, yeah. if you stick around to the end, I, I will be offering a special on my Maceo book on signed copies of that. So hang around for just a little bit longer, and you'll see how you can get a generous discount on that Maceo book and maybe free shipping, nice. too. Nice. Um, this is a photograph of another uh, thing called the... Uh, the Racing Derby at Joyland Park. It was just another entertainment destination, but you can see this is kind of like an aerial swing, except the cars uh, looked like airplanes. So that was kind of fun. And then we get into, at the very end of the 1920s, in 1929, the Buccaneer Hotel was built. Now, of course, unfortunately, it's now demolished. It's the Meridian uh, Retirement Home now, but you can see the Galvez in the background. So the Buccaneer used to be just a couple of blocks west of the Galvez. And so, and this is, uh, the photo says 1945, but I, sh I put it in here in the 1930s, which is the decade we're coming up on now. Uh, this is UTMB over here, but over here is that bayou and that swamp that I told you about that was originally filled in, and that started in the 1930s. After they extended uh, where, that, where the L hooked in the seawall, they began a straight eastward extension to protect Fort San Jacinto that was located all the way at the eastern end of the island. And so after they completed that extension, then they filled in all of that part in between it. And it was called the East End Flats. And it's a neighborhood called Fish Village now over on the East End. And so here we go with the Sui Ren Cafe. Now, this was the second incarnation I'm sorry, third incarnation of the Maceo's restaurant um, on the seawall. It was located on a pier um, um, at 21st Street over the water. And uh, this was opened in 1932. And it was one of the most luxurious things that had ever struck the Texas coast. Now, of course, 20 years later, it would get a different name, but we're gonna get to that. 
And so now we're kind of to that. Now we enter into the 1940s. A couple of these are a little um, out of order, but in the background you see the Galvez and you see the Buccaneer right there as well. And now here you see what is the Pleasure Pier. This is the original Pleasure Pier, actually constructed in 1944. And it was done so originally to entertain the soldiers who were stationed at Fort Crockett. And, um, but this, uh, one, this ballroom right here was made of metal and there was no air conditioning inside of it. And so by the end of the first summer that it had opened, it was, it was just vacant. Nobody wanted to even go there. And so actually Sam Maceo stepped in as well as his business buddy, uh, W.L. Moody and uh, Junior, and they came together and formed another beach corporate, the Pleasure Pier Corporation that uh, came in and did some serious renovations on the Pleasure Pier and made it um, a big ticket in town. And you can see that this is the coolest part. This is my favorite part. They actually had a movie theater, stadium, arena at the very end. So can you imagine sitting in one of those seats and watching a movie and you just have this black expanse of gulf, you know, stretching out behind you. But there was even a museum uh, inside there as well that took you through different Galveston and Texas history exhibits also. Pretty cool. And an aquarium in there also. Uh, this shows the construction of that original Pleasure Pier. Sorry, I'm a little out of order here, but um, $1.5 million is what that Pleasure Pier cost in 1944. Definitely a tidy sum. And of course, this is the iconic Balinese room. Uh, now, the Sui Ren was raided and closed for gambling purposes, for gambling infractions, and uh, as were a couple of other of the Maceo's clubs. And so the Maceo Enterprise got together and decided that they needed to design a raid-proof club, right? Because they weren't doing anything wrong. It was just a little innocent gambling and some, you know, victimless crimes, right? And so the Maceos took the, the pier that the Sui Ren was on and extended it 600 feet out over the Gulf of Mexico. And this long walkway here eventually became known as Ranger Run because that is what the Texas Rangers had to run down in order to get into the Balinese room to try to raid the gambling den, the gambling den uh, that was uh, hidden at the, at the back. And you'll see the Balinese was a tea head. So the dining room was in the base of the tea and then the gambling rooms were at the top of the tea back there. Now, you might not have originally recognized this because uh, in modern history, the Balinese room has a different iconic look, but we'll definitely get to that. But this was the original entrance to the Balinese room, opened in 1942. Originally, it was just supposed to be a remodel of the Sui Ren. Uh, but then on December 7th of 1941, I'll never forget that date because that's my mom's birthday, not just Pearl Harbor. Uh, but so when Pearl Harbor uh, struck Hawaii, of obvi um, obviously everything considered of an Asian motif was pretty much treasonous at that point. And so they did a huge overhaul and within 30 days revamped the new Sui Ren into the Balinese room with the Balinese theme. Um, also opened in the 1940s, 1940 was the Jack Tar. Now, this will give you some more perspective about what I was telling you about, about how this side of the um, seawall was filled in. All right, so this is Sixth Street right here. And so, and so this was the original arm of the seawall. So what you're seeing up here across the top of the screen, that was the extension of the seawall that reached from that curve in the L all the way to the east side, in, east end of the island. And so all of this was filled in. And one of the first um, commercial developments that was placed over there in that filled area was the Jack Tar Hotel. It was a motor inn, one of the first motor inns in Galveston. Uh, this is a, for a photograph of the battery that was located at Fort Crockett. That's now um, around 57th Street. It's where the San Luis is today, between 53rd and 57th. Uh, but this is an anti-aircraft battery they built, and this is the hill that the San Luis now stands atop on. But you can see the anti-aircraft um, missiles there. And interestingly enough, it was, uh, it was a direct threat. Galveston was uh, considered um, a hot spot during World War II simply because we were accessible directly from the water and we did have two uh, military stations, Fort Crockett and Fort San Jacinto, uh, that were located on the islands. 
So now we get into the 1950s, which illustratively are my absolute favorite. The photos that you're about to see come from one of my favorite people in the whole world. His name is Bob Welton, and he helped me. I was originally writing an article about the drive-ins and the diners and the sock hops that took place on the seawall during the 1950s, and fortunately, I was able to translate um, all of that information into my seawall book as well. So here you see him. All these dapper dudes. So there's his Bob right here, actually, right here in the front. And uh, doesn't he look sultry over there? And uh, they were hot rodders. They would. This is um, right in the time when cars started to become customizable. And so young men just latched onto that trend, and they started to build their own hot rods and soup up their cars. They were called the road runners. They all had their own jackets and everything. So this was a big part of the culture on the seawall in the 1950s were the drive-ins, and they had sock hops at the Pleasure Pier, and they would take their cars down to Cherry Hill, which is the big concrete bunker that's still on that eastern portion of the seawall today, and they would race them. And uh, usually those drag races would start out at the drive-in when somebody would say, hey, you know, my car's faster than yours. No, it's not, you know, and then they'd... Uh, Everybody would jump in their cars and go over to Cherry Hill and drag race. And then, then of course, by the time the cops were called, uh, the drag race was over and everybody was back at the drive-in sipping on milkshakes and um, eating their hot dogs. So uh, this, they also um, hosted parades, hot rod parades that uh, careens down the seawall as well. So here you see the road runners, hot rod and custom club. And this is another group, a shot of those guys. I just love these pictures, isn't it? I mean, it just reeks of nostalgia, right? I just love it. And there's Bob again with one of his friends. Now, the K, if you're not familiar with Galveston history, there used to be a high school called Kerwin High School, and this is at one of their school dances. And this is a matchbook, um, actually in the ephemera files at the Galveston and Texas History Center of Rosenberg Library, but Carl's Drive-In. Uh, you can see that 52nd and Broadway. So they were on Broadway. They were on the seawall. They were everywhere. Several uh, drive-ins as well. So now we get to the 1960s. And this is when, of course, to back up, the whole Maceo Empire was uh, dismantled in 1957 and by the Texas Rangers and Attorney General Will Wilson. And so the Balinese Room was closed. You know, they, they thought they were going to be able to reopen it, but they never were. And so it sat there dormant and empty and vacant for a long time until 1965 when it was purchased by Christy Mitchell, who was the brother of George Mitchell. And Christy uh, took the Balinese Room, and he's the one who designed and constructed the iconic facade that we know of the Balinese room today. And so you can kind of see, this is the frame of it. So that kind of more Asian facade that it has now, or I guess Balinese-ish looking, um, that was actually not the original Balinese room. Uh, a lot of people think that it was, but uh, that picture I showed you earlier was that. Also in the 1960s came the rise of beach clubs on the beach and dance clubs. So here you can see in their little uh, disco paisley dresses uh, rocking out on the sand. They're actually dancing on the sand in the 1960s. Uh, this is a, uh, another picture of one of those. This is called the Hut Club, one of those beach huts uh, clubs that they would uh, have dance parties, and that was a big part of the culture in the 1960s as well. And, of course, that was helped along by the advent of rock and roll. And uh, so uh, during the 1950s, of course, the music was still a little, you know, uh, in the early 50s, a little, you know, slow and sultry, and then, you know, people wanted to shake their booties, and so 60s, kind of late 50s and 60s kind of jazzed things up, and that's what um, uh, contributed to the, the rise of dance clubs on the seawall. And uh, here's another photo of one of those clubs. So, of course, during the daytime, they would be more recreational areas with swings and, and such, but then during the nighttime, all of this would kind of transform into a, more of a nightlife scene as well. And uh, this is a photograph of the Mountain Speedway in the 1960s, which in 1960 was actually demolished. Um, and, uh, but it was, it was built in the 1920s, but it was a wooden roller coaster um, that was located just one block um, south, no, sorry, north of the seawall. And so if anyone remembers the Mountain Speedway, that must have been a lot of fun. Uh, in 1960, it was dismantled. Ended up being really good timing um, because Hurricane Carla struck in 1961. And uh, I can't imagine what destruction that would have caused if Hurricane Carla had picked up all of that and, th and strewn it across the seawall. 
Another addition to the seawall in the 1960s was the Seahorse Hotel. Pretty cool little pad over here. You see that the colors are just what gets me, those baby blue doors and walls. Um, and this became a really iconic piece of the seawall as well. Now, you have to understand that the 1960s was a real um, big time of change for Galveston because, like I said, the Maceo Empire had been dismantled in 1957. And But during that time, during 1920 through 1957, um, Galveston had no desire whatsoever to become a family-friendly beach town, okay? That was the last thing from our minds. We had Frank Sinatra dining at the Balinese Room. We had Doris Day and Bob Hope per performing, uh, you know, at the Balinese Room. And so there was no need for kind of this family-friendly emphasis that we have today because we were the lap of luxury and we were, you know, um, kind of attracting a whole different uh, demographic of people. Now, of course, day trippers were still welcome and they played the tip books and the slot machines um, just while, you know, their counterparts were at the fancy clubs like the Hollywood and the Balinese. Um, but that wasn't, again, the emphasis. And it wasn't until uh, the Maceo Empire was dismantled and then Galveston spent about the next four or five years kind of wallowing in its own sorrow, uh, you know, and languishing because of what it had lost. And then in the early um, 60s, uh, when Carla struck, that's really what galvanized the community. Also built was the Sierrama. And this is an aerial view of Sierrama over here. Here's the entrance right here. This is one of the very first marine parks that was ever installed in the United States and the first in Texas. And so anything that you think about modern, you know, day sea world uh, was kind of at Sierrama. I have a photo of the entrance there, Sierrama. So Sierrama, along with the construction of the flagship hotel that was built on the base of the original Pleasure Pier, those were two huge catalysts in the 1960s and kind of gave us that push towards becoming a family-friendly beach town. Another one was Stewart Beach. Uh, Stewart Beach is still there, but it doesn't look anything like this today, obviously. It's not nearly this colorful uh, today. And originally, Stewart today, it has a little, you know, um, some amenities. It has, uh, you know, some bathrooms and a concession stand, I think. But originally, the amenities at Stewart Park, there was a putt-putt course over here, uh, restaurants, tables, you know, everything. There was a lot more um, to the original beach park at Stewart Peach Beach that was uh, installed in the 1960s also. Another thing that happened in the 60s um, was it, construction began out on the eastern portion of the seawall. You can barely see back here, that's the seawall right there. That's the eastern side of it that went towards San Jacinto, uh, Fort San Jacinto. And this was the very first condominium building uh, called the Islander East that still stands today. And now it has several other condo buildings on either side of it, the Palisade Palms, and there's another one as well. And uh, this uh, is a photograph um, actually a little bit later, um, but you can see this is the, where the seawall ends right here. This curve is still there from 3005 and all that. And, and so you can see how undeveloped all this area was, you know, back then. And in the 1960s is when um, actually uh, wealthy families from Houston uh, started to decide that they wanted to build weekend and beach homes in Galveston. And so it was called Condominium Row that eventually sprang up down this western portion of the seawall here. Many of those condos are still there today um, as well. But right now in this picture, and this picture is actually from the 80s. Uh, so that's, um, uh, I'm sorry, the 70s. And so that started all around that time and just kind of gradually inched this way. So another popular figure. So the last chapter in the book, not the last chapter, second, second to last chapter deals with the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Did I do that right? 70s, 80s, and 90s? 70s, 80s, and 90s, sorry. And so all of that um, was kind of, I kind of, you know, accumulated together because there weren't really a lot of, you know, high profile things that happened during that time, uh, just some more sentimental pieces. Uh, this was Bongo Joe, who was a popular figure on the seawall. Many of you might remember him. This is a photograph of the Jack Tar Hotel during the 60s. You notice the cool pirate sign, pirate ship sign. And this is the front of the Balinese room. This is probably what most of you guys remember uh, the Balinese room looking like with this pointed facade here. And of course, um, they still had live music and such like that as well, of course, without the gambling. Now, these next series of pictures, um, earlier I told you that, you know, I mentioned that the seawall evolved 
uh, you know, to kind of encapsulate each decade. And the next three photos, uh, I didn't even plan this, okay? I just found these photos randomly, but they perfectly illustrate what I'm talking about. So here we have 70s, ready for it? 80s and 90s. And I'll give you three guesses who that is, and the first two don't count. <laughs> That's me in the 90s. Look, check out the rollerblades in my flannel. I was so cool. <laughs> Yeah, so let's do it again, 70s, 80s, 90s. So you can just see how even though the culture kind of stayed the same, it, we just still never cease to embody whatever fashion and whatever trends were going on um, at the time. So I looked forever for this picture, by the way. <laughs> and I knew this picture oh, just existed. For us? Oh, no, 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 okay. for the book. Oh, I love no, it. No, I knew that it existed because yeah. I was like so proud of my outfit that day, I think, or something. And you can't see my cool Doc Martens backpack that I'm wearing. <laughs> it was like shiny silver. It was just awesome. Anyway, so I'd always remembered this picture because this was a very specific memory that I had. We specifically came to Galveston to go rollerblading on the seawall. And uh, so I knew this picture existed, um, and, but I, I looked and looked and looked, and finally, finally, I found it uh, right in time for the book. Uh, this brings us up to more present day, 21st century, and what's going on with the seawall today. Now, this is the flagship hotel that I mentioned was built in the 1960s as kind of another catalyst for, uh, you know, reviving Galveston. Unfortunately, this is the, what it looked like after Hurricane Ike in 2008 which it fared much better than the Balinese room, which was completely washed away. Um, but this is, uh, you can just see it was, it was irreparable, uh, the damage that it suffered. And so, it would get, of course, it was eventually torn down and converted into the modern day pleasure pier that we have today. So, this is another icon of today's seawall, the spot. And so, you can walk by that. And one of the biggest things that's happening today or that's happened over the past few years are the beach restorations. Now, everybody knows that when you go to the beach, sand gets everywhere, right? It doesn't matter how much you rinse off. It doesn't matter, you know, how long you stay, how much you walk on the concrete, that sand is going to be sticky. And because of that, sand um, is very fallible. It doesn't stick around. It moves and it accretes and it gets washed away and erodes and such like this. And so over the past few years, we've um, launched two huge beach restorations uh, that were spurred by the park, the Galveston Park Board of Trustees. And so now this um, area of the seawall, the water used to reach all the way up to the seawall actually. Um, but the greatest parts was that the beach restorations were actually um, done in the same exact way that the grade raising was done. Um, they, if you, you might have remember it from a few years ago, if you were in Galveston, there were huge lengths of pipe that they ran down, um, ran down the beach here, and then they would push in that watery fill, and they would, they would blast that watery fill up onto the part of the beach that was already there, and then the water would uh, drift away, and what was left was the sand. So that is the Reader's Digest version of what we got here in our Galveston Seawall Chronicles. And uh, so, yeah, again, it just, it was amazing to me, and it's something that I didn't even know when I started writing it, was um, just how, what a testament it was to, to Galveston's creativity and um, our community's ability to adapt and to overcome, not just in building the seawall and in elevating the grade, but also in using the seawall to cater um, to all of our wonderful visitors and tourists that we have every year. Well, that was amazing. I want to once again thank Timber Fountain for joining us today. And uh, really, we have an uh, opportunity to talk about your book, uh, The Galveston Seawall Chronicles. Talk about um, the opportunity you're going to offer people. This sure. Before we do prizes and questions, by the way, because we're getting close, by the way. And thank you for bearing with us. Um, thank you to, to I'm told, uh, Martha, Marsha, Marsha Lutz, Martha, uh, Catherine, uh, Rose, Sharon, y'all are wonderful for bearing with us and letting us know that the signal is freezing on us, so oh, you may no. not have seen all of the show. Uh, we apologize for that. It's one of those technical uh, things that we're going to work on for future shows. So, But thank y'all for staying with us because uh, we've got prizes. we got uh, the questions coming up in a second. Uh, but do you want to talk about uh, your book opportunities? Sure. So for today only, for my special viewers of the Heritage Society and Mr. McKinney, where I'm relaunching, you may have seen one of our promo videos, and yeah. we did a free shipping promo with this uh, code Seawall120. So just for today, for the remaining hours of September 30th today, uh, the promo code Seawall120 will get you free shipping on any and all of my books. And this is when you purchase directly from me, mind you. And we're going to put that link in 
in the comments. Right here. Oh, it's right there, kimberfountain.square.site. But also, easier, even easier way, if you go to my uh, Facebook page, my author page, and click on Shop Now, that'll take you straight to my site as well. So the code Seawall120, in commemoration of the 120th anniversary of the Great Storm of 1900, will get you free shipping on anything. But as an added bonus for all of you Heritage Society lovers, I'm offering 15% off my Maceo book, and that code is just Facebook Live. All caps, all one word, Facebook Live will get you 15% off. Now, they will come signed. They will come personalized if you'd like. And um, they're from a na nationwide publisher named Arcadia, so they're absolutely and beautiful. There are some amazing they're photos, gorgeous. by the way, in all of these books, very detailed, well researched. Uh, you know, archival material there too. I mean, it's just a really special time capsule about Galveston's history. Uh, you know, Kimber Fountain is amazing when it comes to uh, really researching and loving Galveston as much as I'm sure some of y'all watching do. So if you don't have these part of your collection or library, you certainly should. And uh, she's offering some amazing discounts today. Yeah. So take advantage of them. Um, now we have our fun part, which are the questions part. So we okay. got five questions. Five. It was very detailed. So maybe we want to kind of stretch them out a little bit. So the beginning of your talk, the middle of your talk, the end of your talk. Uh, okay. We still have lots of folks that are still tuning in. All right. I can't say enough to these folks that have been with us since mm, the beginning. Uh, Patricia's trivia. still with us. Let's see, Rebecca, Beverly. Uh, Randy Pace was joining a little bit earlier. Uh, so a lot of fun folks. Uh, Jenny Murphy, so thank you all for being there and really being a part of today's show. All right. Well, I, let's see. I won't get too hard on me with dates because I don't think I really threw in too many specifics of the dates. Um, okay, so here's an, yeah, we'll start off with an easy one. Yeah. What was the shape of the original seawall? That is an easy question. That is a very... So <laughs> what is the shape of the original seawall, okay? There you so go. So hopefully you guys are getting that. Let's see if anybody's chiming in. Uh, like I said, the, the, the internet connection may be good or bad for some folks, so hopefully. But the first, the first, first question again was, what was the original shape of the seawall? Okay, so <laughs> totally can you so guess? Easy. All right, and the story was All great, right. too. That's the first question. What was the All original right. shape? Next question. Okay, next question. What hotel that still stands today was built in commemoration and celebration of the completion of the grade raising? Okay, so what iconic hotel is still around today and was built um, uh, it, it, to celebrate the completion of the grade raising and the seawall itself. You know the name of the hotel. It celebrated a milestone a couple of years ago, it seems, but I guess it wasn't. Yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, we're coming up Time on another flies. anniversary I coming know. up soon. Wow, yeah. how about that? Okay, that's actually where we met. We, had, we, we hung out there, so that's yeah. great. Okay, that's the next question. That iconic hotel, you know the one we're talking about. Chime in. Is anybody chiming in? Good, some people are chiming in. Okay, we see some stuff over here. Good, good, good. All Sandra right. Lord and Marsha Lutz, our buddy over there, is chiming in. Catherine Fitzgerald also chiming in. Thank you, ladies. Keep chiming in. What's our third question? Um, Let me see. Should I do another? Uh, no, I already did a hotel one. Let's see. All right. I said this really quickly. So if you can get this one, okay. you're paying attention. What is the name of the strip of the seawall where the guys in the 50s would drag race their cars? It was two words, and it was a fruit. I'll give you a hint. That's it. Okay, you One got a hint, by the way. It's a fruit, and it's two words, okay? And it was the dr a stretch of the seawall along the eastern end, still there today. It's a concrete bunker, and there was a name for it, and it's where people drag raced. Okay. Their car and still kind of do sometimes. Today. You never know. We need two <laughs> names and that's a fruit. So there you go. Yeah, two okay. words. Yeah. Two, two words, words in two the words, name. Two words. Yeah. Okay, in that name itself. Okay. Great. More folks are also joining us too, which is wonderful. Thank awesome. you for doing that. They okay. want to win those prizes. They sure do. Okay. How about the uh, fourth question? Fourth question. All right. So what we're in the fifties. So let's see. Um, okay. Who was the man who built the I'm sorry, who purchased the Balinese room by, at auction, by the way, I didn't mention that, but Ooh. he bought the Balinese room and then converted it, the front of it, into the more iconic facade that we remember today. Look at that. And he has another famous relative, famous relative that also. would go on and, and shape the Galveston mm -hmm. Island as well that gives you some clue to what we're talking about. Okay, so you, I, I heard the name too, and it's in our presentation, so she said it earlier. Okay, so once again, the question is, who is uh, the name of the gentleman who purchased at auction the Balinese room and then changed the iconic facade that we know today, the more recent facade? Uh, so that's a good question. Okay, so if you watch the presentation, you know folks are chiming in. We've got some folks chiming in. Rose is chiming in. Good job, Rose. You're chiming in. 
Not sure if the answer is right. We're gonna we're gonna answer those <laughs> in the there, next right? week's show. All right. So fifth and final question. Okay. Hmm. How about something in the '60s? Maybe about uh, how Galveston kind of changed her family. Well, that family. was '60s. That the was the okay, room right. okay, was so '60s. Let's move in. All right. This is gonna be a two. I think this is gonna going to be this is going to be a three part answer. Is that okay? Can I do that? Because it's it's pretty easy. Ooh. Or no. Well, then, then, then people might get half of oh, it. Oh, right. half of it, right. Okay. What a clean right, answer. So never mind. Clean okay. answer to be fair to you guys watching us. Okay. All right, hold on. I got to think. Because um, we did 60s, and then we did. Um, okay. Hmm. Okay. Oh, man. Oh, I'm blanking. <laughs> you gave me a good, like a good lift, and then I just was like, no, I already did that. Oh, uh, I, I've 60s. got one. I've got one. Oh, why don't you go in? Okay, you so here's one, one because all, you I'm should know the answer. Maybe you hung out there back in the day, but how about it was what you said it was one of the first ever water parks or, or water, I don't want to give it away, of its kind. Oh, I was going to okay. ask that one, but I thought yeah. it might be too easy. It's really easy, but I don't see me chiming in now, but, uh, and the first one in Texas, so we can maybe go with that. The first blank in Texas. Entertainment venue. First, inter we, we want inter the name of the first entertainment venue of its kind. Uh, you know, uh, entertainment venue of its kind. You know kind. what we're talking you know about. We're talking about. <laughs> the first one to chime in gets the answer. And that no was in the 1960s in also. Yes, so okay. that's five good questions. I showed you an aerial shot and I showed you the front. You see as two well. photos. You should know the answer, but it's out there. So thank you so much for that. That was a good All one. right. All right. Uh, people are chiming in right now, which we appreciate. Continue to chime in, guys and girls and ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think that we're now out of time, and we want to once again thank Kimber Fountain for joining us. Lastly, we want to make sure we thank you, you for tuning in every single Wednesday at 7 o'clock at the Heritage Society and Mr. McKinsey Story Houston Facebook Live and Instagram Live page. Thank you to Alana, Isaac, Kian, Kai, um, Ted, uh, and of course, thank you to Allison Ayers Bell and then Manette Basil, our board chair. And lastly, good night. So thank you for joining us, guys. Take care. Thank you. Yes, and see you in Galveston. Mountain. See you in Galveston. Get mm -hmm. her books so you can learn more about the history of Galveston in the area. Take care, Houston.